All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, daily update here with uh, Paul Mounds uh, via uh, the virtual world, Josh Jabal, Amy Porter with us, a commissioner of aging and disability, because we are going to be focused on uh, vulnerable populations today. And uh, Dr. Coe is here on behalf of the reopening committee to take any questions you've got as the um, reopening committee starts to wrap up its work uh, aiming towards uh, our May 20 date. Uh, very quickly, I'll just show you on our daily summary. Um, you could say the positive cases are up, but I'm a glass half full type of person. What that means is, is a percentage of the tests performed, it's uh, down and uh, slightly under 10%, which is again a very important metric. And I'm very pleased that the uh, number of tests you see are ramping up uh, 6,600. Uh, tragically, another 94 fatalities, and that's up as well a little bit over the last few days. And current hospitalizations now in its uh, third week of a downward progression, which is such an important metric for us. Let's just jump ahead now to um, what we need to do to uh, protect the most vulnerable of our populations. That's important, as we've said before, because it's um, the right thing to do. You know, African Americans are uh, much more likely to be infected, much more likely to suffer real complications. And it's also important to do when you look at the fact that um, it's in certain areas that you have the most risk of a flare-up. Uh, look at the congregate housing here, for example. Who do we need to protect? The congregate housing, you know, that's assisted living, that's uh, prisons, that's nursing homes. Um, these are the groups that are really important that we keep them protected, which is part of what our testing protocol is going to be and why we focus on that. Frontline workers. You know, look at the uh, nurses, the uh, first responders, the, our um, officials, um, public safety. They're the folks interfacing every day, often with these uh, vulnerable populations. These are folks who we're going to take a special effort to protect. Racial and ethnic minorities, as I suggested before, particularly vulnerable. Uh, A, because they have some pre-existing conditions, but uh, also densely populated communities, those that live in areas where it's not easy to socially distance, where you have more people in a home. Those are the populations we're really going to focus on when it comes to testing, when it comes to the support groups. And finally, that group that is high risk due to age. Uh, unfortunately, I am in that category. And uh, people over the age of uh, 60, 65, uh, they should be staying at home. Even as we slowly think about reopening parts of our economy, they should be staying close to home. And those, again, that have some of the pre-existing conditions, especially that which impacts the lungs, say asthma, those are the things that give you the greatest risk, and those are the people we need to protect. So our priorities when it comes to testing is uh, A, vastly ramping up our testing, mass testing in those most vulnerable populations, focusing on them both in terms of symptomatic, those who have the symptoms of uh, COVID, flu-like symptoms, and also those who are asymptomatic. So we can make an extra effort to make sure that those populations are safe. That's how we reach the vulnerable. And then uh, Amy will help us describe how we support the vulnerable once we find out what that status is. So testing, how do we ramp up our testing? As you know, over the last few days, we've described some of the partnerships we have, Yale New Haven, Jackson recently here, uh, Genesis uh, Diagnostics, Hartford Healthcare, Quest. These are all groups that are gonna allow us to ramp up our testing. We said we'd be doing um, 42,000 tests a week starting next week, and Josh is highly confident we're gonna blow through that number. And I think it's really important and ramp up uh, towards 100,000 and beyond in June. I can't overemphasize how important testing is, but testing is only works if you're willing to get tested. And uh, right now, as you know, we have a lot of capacity at our hospitals, a lot of uh, capacity still at our drive-through facility in um, New Haven. You probably heard we're gonna be um, rolling out additional testing facilities in our partnership with CVS. I think another uh, 12 pharmacies be up and operating very soon to make testing more easily available for each and every one of you. We're rolling out on our community health centers so that um, the most vulnerable populations in those tougher neighborhoods can know they can get tested, they can get tested safely, they can get tested without cost, and no cost for treatment. And um, 
Finally, we're working closely with our um, churches as well as the community centers. Uh, Senator McCrory has helped us there as well as we try and get the message out how uh, it's important that you go out and do that testing and the pharmacies allow us to take the test to you. So when it comes to our priority, when it's a uh, mass testing, uh, here we are at the Phillips Health Center in Hartford's North End. This is the program that Doug McCrory helped us uh, put together. They already have 300 people who have been uh, uh, tested to date, and we're ramping that up, and um, it's uh, really important. How do we reach the vulnerable? How do we reach out to them? You know, there we're working, um, as I said before, with some of our um, fellow stakeholders, starting with the churches. Uh, multilingual, uh, you're going on um, radio and other broadcast media, um, Spanish, English, Go where people are and tell them what this means to you and your family and what it means to uh, your greater community. We'll be supplementing that with more uh, public service advertising. And there you see our contact tracing, which um, I think we have a chance to talk about in a minute. Support for the vulnerable. You know, here um, Amy's uh, team is helping to take the lead because if you're tested and you're found to be um, uh, COVID uh, infected, your test positive, what do we do for you? Does it mean you just, uh, you know, by yourself and self-quarantine and word? No. If you're in a crowded situation, we provide you housing support at one of the uh, local hotels in particular. We provide food support for you. We've really ramped that up uh, courtesy of Brian Hurlbut, our commissioner um, of agriculture. Uh, we're able to deliver, um, Amy says, I think it's hundreds of meals now a day here just in the um, greater Hartford area to those who are um, in, the, in the hotel or those who are self-quarantined for one reason or another. The medical support is uh, so key as well. And um, I think there you're going to find that we're uh, ramping that up, and I'll get to that in a second. And finally, the COVID care kit we'll talk about. Next slide, please. A lot of talk about our reopening metrics and where do we stand on that. And um, I was accusing Josh of a little bit of grade inflation today, but he's explained to me um, that I think we're doing pretty well in these metrics. Obviously, we're way beyond a 14-day decline in hospitalizations. I think you're seeing that we're going to uh, not only test uh, 42,000 and beyond uh, next week. I think on the uh, contact tracing, there's a question about what is sufficient. But, uh, you know, Dr. Koh was saying um, a contact tracer can maybe take on um, 10 or 12 new clients a day. And uh, given that number, we have over 300 um, uh, volunteers right now working through our local health departments. So that would mean we could handle, um, starting right now, say 3,000 folks who are tested positive uh, on a daily basis. That's one definition of sufficient. I think we described a little bit what we're doing for the vulnerable populations, and we can always do more. Uh, healthcare capacity and PPE, we've talked a lot about why we think we're in strong position there. Finally, um, so far, appropriate physical distancing regulation, I think we've been strong on, and I've been really proud of the people of Connecticut to uh, follow that. But I also worry, because this is a place where you can fall backwards. Uh, this is a place where you look around the country, you see it's not just in a nursing home, it's uh, not just in a prison where you have a flare-up. You see uh, Tokyo, no, it was South Korea, Seoul, I think it was, where one super spreader went to uh, several nightclubs and infected um, many, many people. I saw that in Wisconsin uh, yesterday, the day before, the Supreme Court lifted the stay-at-home regulations and, you know, hundreds piled into the bars. So appropriate physical distancing regulations, that's one I watch like a hawk going forward. Um, with that, I'd just really like to ask uh, Amy Porter to say a few things about where we are on these vulnerable populations. And then we're all here to take your questions. Dr. Coe is here and Paul Mounds as well. Amy? Thank you, Governor. Yeah, um, and thank you for having me here today. Protecting our at-risk populations is something that is a significant priority for the administration. We've been working across state agencies, across the administration. We've been working with state and local health partners. We've been working with community organizations to address the needs of specific populations. I have been fortunate to um, work on the Reopen Community Committee, and it is an incredible group of people. 
It is chaired by Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who is the Director of Equity Research and Innovation at the Yale School of Medicine. We also have members, a pretty diverse set of members. Marie Allen is the ad Executive Director of the Southwestern Connecticut Area Agency on Aging and Independent Living. Dr. Ken Aline is the Vice Chair of the Connecticut Health Foundation. Nora Duncan, the State Director of Connecticut AARP. Rochelle Palash is the Assistant D District Leader for an SEIU local. Daria Smith, the Executive Director of the Connecticut State Independent Living Council. Mike Frieda from the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. And then I'm, we're also joined by three of our fellow commissioners, Commissioner Gifford, Commissioner Sheff, and Commissioner Delphin Rittman. This group of individuals has spent an enormous amount of time trying to identify the needs, trying to listen to the voices in the community, and they all bring their own extensive networks of folks. When the governor talks about outreach and having people go out and speak to the communities, these are all individuals with their own incredible networks, and they have, they're all incredibly committed to going out and having these conversations, figuring out the key messages so that as we ramp up the contact tracing, as we think about more people in quarantine and isolation who might need sub supports, we can encourage people to do that knowing that we're going to have the system in place. If somebody needs access to housing, um, as the governor said, if they need access to food, if they're trying to figure out, I, I have symptoms but I'm not sure if they're significant enough and I don't have a doctor. I don't have a place to go. So making sure that people are connected with active clinical monitoring and, and really the tools that they need through a care kit, like a thermometer, a pulse oximeter, um, masks, um, emergency um, information, educational materials about what to do as symptoms progress. So that's all the, the pieces that we're ramping up to make sure that folks that are in quarantine and isolation are supported as we move forward. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, any questions, Max? The Connecticut Mirror. Good afternoon. Um, Governor, you are, I, I assume, in receipt of a letter from 11 Democratic state senators, which I, I won't go into all the letter because it, it, it is uh, chock full of questions. But uh, first question, do you have a general response to their concern, which is quite simply that they have doubts that the state is ready, that they don't have confidence that the metrics for how to judge when it's safe to reopen and remain open um, have been defined. They also have questions about the availability of testing uh, and contact tracing. So could you please give a response to that? I think they should um, listen to our briefings here. Um, I think um, Dr. Koh and his team helped put together a set of metrics. I believe uh, uh, the Senate Democrats thought the metrics were really appropriate. Then we've tried to do on at least a weekly basis, as we did today, to show you where we stand on each of those metrics. Um, uh, maybe they wanted more testing, but we've far exceeded what we um, planned to do. And they, maybe they want more contact tracing, but we tried to say we have more than enough to handle everybody we find to be uh, infected now. Can we always do more? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the ongoing concern that people have. But I think we've got the right balance going forward right now. I think you have a sense that we put public health and public safety first and foremost. And whatever we do, we're doing very cautiously. Um, well, it at least two of those people on that uh, letter were people who have participated in your briefings. And, and they're, they're generally um, complementary of the advisory group, um, even as they raise these questions. Um, but uh, to what dis extent does this uh, – well, let me, no, let me ask another question. Um, when it comes to contact tracing, Joe Brennan, uh, the CBIA president, on the business roundtable call earlier today, he offered another concern about contact tracing. And his concern was once Connecticut reopens businesses, that it'll be very important if there is uh, any outbreaks to be able to accurately and quickly trace the source. Otherwise, the fear is that you will have to 
uh, close businesses again, which his view would be that would be disastrous. So uh, can you address the question of how important it would be for contact tracing to be done to make sure that uh, there's a confidence that businesses are safe places for people to come in as consumers and to be there as workers? Yeah, I think nobody takes that more seriously than the businesses themselves. I think they know that if um, uh, their restaurant or their um, barber shop, we found that there was uh, an infection there, what that would mean in terms of business, what that would mean in terms of their employees, what that would mean towards the entire perception. So I'm, um, we've got very strict protocols for each and every one of these facilities. Most of them uh, paths are by appointment only, so we'll know exactly who is in and out of those facilities. And, um, you know, I've heard from some of the um, folks in the legislature, maybe you're going too fast. I heard from 130 restaurants yesterday, you're going too slow. We're trying to get a balance going forward to keep you safe first and foremost and convince you that on the, all these key metrics, which we described uh, at the beginning of this session, uh, we're, we're taking your health first and foremost. And the last thing is, that one of the questions was about um, uh, looking at your approach to statewide standards as opposed to Governor Cuomo, who is now talking about uh, differentiating um, reopening based on county. Um, what's your latest thinking on that? Is Do you still see Connecticut as just too small to, to go on a county-by-county county basis, or are you open to perhaps some differentiation uh, by county? At this point, I just think we're too small. I mean, to go to Lake Erie is a six-hour drive, but um, if you're in New Haven, you can get to any part of this state in, a, um, in an hour or so. We're a relatively small state, so the idea that you would open up a restaurant here or not there or a um, hair salon here but not there, I think the possibility is promoting a lot of traffic back and forth. But, you know, frankly, um, we can always take a second look at that as we see what transpires going forward. But that's my strong inclination so far. And frankly, it was a strong inclination of the Reopen Connecticut Committee who I listened to. Thank you. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Hello, how's everybody today? <laughs> my question is, I did sit on, on the round table today, and it's clear that the Department of Economic Development and Everyone, all the partners on the committee have been working to put this plan together. Uh, but a lot of businesses, restaurants and uh, hair salons, many may decide not to reopen next week because they just can't institute and implement all of the things. What kind of message do you think that will send to people that it's still not safe or it's going to get better? I think it would send the opposite message, that these restaurants or salons are very thoughtful. They're only going to open when they're absolutely ready. And if they want to take an extra week or two, I think that's totally appropriate. And I think we've seen that uh, around the country. And my other question is, it's more on the lines, kind of what Mark had said, the confidence level. You know, after reading some of these guidelines, and albeit safe, smart, practical, uh, you know, people going to restaurants with masks on and having to wear them at tables, uh, that's difficult, isn't it? Well, that's one reason we didn't like indoor dining, and we thought outdoor dining uh, was an awful lot safer. And uh, if you're implying that you know, if they wear a mask, would that be make people more anxious about going there? I think just the opposite. It would say to me that this is a facility that takes uh, the protocols very seriously. Dr. Coe, do you want to add anything to that question? Yeah, I, I think what, what we know and, and uh, you know, what we've, we've known from outbreaks throughout the world, but also here in the United States, is that it's, it's really being indoors in confined spaces, which is, is uh, problematic and has a higher risk. When you're outside, you have hundreds of liters of air exchange coming through. The risk is really quite mitigated. And so that was, I think, behind the... Um, the, you know, the Reopen Connecticut uh, Advisory Board, but also the state's recommendations to, you know, have outdoor activities, just as we're doing with biking and hiking, but also outdoor activities, whether it's you know, outdoor restaurants, this is kind of the same logic. And, and I think also the other, you know, issue, and just to reinforce what the governor had said, is, is that 
in the criteria, the guiding principles for reopening for phase one, choice is an important one. So those restaurants, those businesses that are not feel that they can, you know, go on these guidelines, which are actually quite well developed by our, our He was making an excellent point, but maybe we should um, keep he going does. for a second. Max? Uh, we will get back to uh, Dr. Ko. Uh, Thank you. Uh, for, now we will, for now, we will move along next to NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon. Sticking with the restaurant question, uh, this afternoon during the roundtable, or this morning, I should say, the, the Connecticut Restaurant Association brought up the point there that there are a lot of restaurants that are being left out of this May 20th opening just by the fact that they may not have a patio. Um, they're urging the state to allow limited indoor seating and dining beginning June 3rd. Do you think that's feasible? And if not, when can we expect that to start to happen? My instinct is that it's early, and uh, I want to see a little more um, experience with the outside dining first. I've been impressed, though. I mean, uh, Sarah Bronin here in Hartford, Freddie Camillo down in Greenwich, people are thinking really creatively about how to um, close down some roads to traffic, open up more for pedestrian traffic, more room for outdoor seating. I think it could be very interesting in, um, over the course of the next month, and we'll learn a lot. And secondly, now that we're getting some nicer weather, a lot of parents want to know when will the local playground be open? Will the pools open this summer? Um, where does that fall in your phases? And will you be leaving that decision ultimately up to the municipalities? Uh, right now, that's a decision that's left up to the municipalities. So they control their local parks and the access there. But uh, my instinct is that could be since it's outside, we can do it carefully. If they have people there that can clean off the swing set, we, we could do that uh, perhaps in the next round, but maybe Paul or Dr. Ko would have an insight there. Paul's on mute. I am on mute. No, what you said right there, Governor, is right online. Uh, that that uh, Local decision, local pool, uh, local uh, park is uh, a decision for the local municipalities. Uh, we have set standards uh, through the Department of uh, Energy and Environmental Protection for our parks and for our beaches. Uh, and we, we also hope that municipalities would uh, follow the, uh, the lead that uh, Katie Dykes and her team through the reopen committee as well have put forward. Uh, that's also serving as a, a guide for our regional partners as well. Thank you. And Dr. Ko has rejoined us. Dr. Ko, the question was uh, the possibility of playgrounds and local parks reopening at some point and what might be required in order for that to happen. Unmute. I think there was a previous question about the safety of, of um, activities, whether social or business outdoors. And outdoors is certainly much safer than indoors in confined spaces. And in terms of making playgrounds and uh, in our parks safe, I think the, really the, the concern is to maintain social distancing, uh, the use of face masks that prevents transmission from person to person. And I think the, the third point, which is important in keeping our parks and our playgrounds safe is the uh, disinfection. We know that we have in our respiratory secretions and our saliva virus that potentially can infect other people you know, the practice is to keep those, you know, disinfected frequently, especially those that are, are being touched, um, such as in bathrooms in our parks or whether they're swings or slides, uh, the constant dis disinfection. These are all in the guidelines that uh, are being actually um, being reviewed and, and uh, formulated from our, uh, from our occupational review group. Move along next to the day of New London. Hello, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask you about a, another letter you may have received. This is uh, from the Southeastern Connecticut contingent. It was dated yesterday. Um, and they're asking uh, for, for you to address the uh, situation in Eastern Connecticut where the uh, unemployment claims are spiking um, largely because of the unemployment coming from the casinos. As you know, Fox was. Uh, 
uh, change the status of their workforce from furloughed to uh, to laid off or will be as of May 31. No more health benefits. So I'm wondering what your what your response is to that letter, and in which they also ask again uh, that by executive order you authorize online gaming and sports betting as a way for the the uh, tribes to generate some revenue. Um, and maybe as a secondary question, I mean, just wondering what is the status of your talks with the tribes, and are you involved in those personally, and how and how often uh, are they taking place? Uh, yes, I have had conversations with the tribal leaders. I'm trying to find ways to move this forward that does not result in endless litigation, and we can move this forward. The tribes have been amazing partners for this state for a long time. Uh, I feel desperately for um, the folks that were furloughed and then laid off. Um, thankfully, we have a good workman's unemployment compensation system. It's on time, getting the payments out now with um, a true up from the federal government. So I think that's something that carries people forward for a while until we can get the casinos open safely. And there's, there's no possibility of an executive order or any action in that way? Have you sort of addressed that, that issue already? Uh, an executive order to? To authorize online gaming, sports betting. Uh, no, I think that's going to take a little more discussion right now. There are a lot of players involved in that who have strong feelings, and I want to. I would like to see this get done in a way that uh, saves us from endless litigation. We haven't gotten it done for the last five years, but I think you're right. Now is a good time to have that conversation. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor Lamont. This is Taylor DiCello. Um, I'd also like to respond to the comment that you just said that we have a good unemployment system that's on time and getting payments out now. Well, since the beginning of April, I've been working with Nancy Steffens at the Department of Labor to answer people's common questions. This evolved to where I'm now personally sending the Department of Labor specific claims. I answer nearly 200 emails a day from claimants who say they cannot get a hold of the Department of Labor. Many of them respond saying, I'm the first person they've heard from in nearly two months in regards to their unemployment claim. I was just on the Department of Labor call, and they say they're hiring dozens of people to help answer general questions. But this does not help people today who haven't seen any income for two months. So, Governor, what are you personally going to do to expedite this process and ensure the people of Connecticut that when they pick up the phone to call the Department of Labor, someone else is going to pick up on the other side and help them? Yeah, no, that's a fair question. Um, unemployment claims, as we said before, spiked up dramatically. Our old cobalt system, the number of people there had a hard time keeping up. Thanks to a lot of amazing work over there, we've answered, I think, well over um, 95% of those claims, well over 450,000 um, payments have come out. The $600 true up has come. They had some catching up to do. You're absolutely right about uh, the self-employed, but I think we've had tens of thousands of those payments have been made. I'd like to think we're very close on that. There are, though, um, still uh, many, many where maybe there was an error or a problem in terms of the original submission. Those have been slowed up. Those generate an awful lot of telephone traffic. Obviously, online results are a lot faster, but I can tell you that the commissioner there is doing everything he can to get additional people there to answer phones, because in this time of crisis, uh, tomorrow is not soon enough. Maybe you're not aware of the situation fully, but we have people who call the Department of Labor and are on the phone for six hours, and then the Department of Labor phone lines close and their call is never answered. So why does it take us pushing you to get people hired at the Department of Labor in order to answer general questions people have. I mean, I'm having trouble answering these people's emails. I'm looking at an email right now from Emily. She's a single mother of a five-year-old. She hasn't had any money in two months. So what do you suggest I say to her? Just wait it out another week? Well, first of all, I didn't need you pushing me. Um, this is front and center in terms of all of our priorities. Uh, we faced it head on a, a couple of months ago when this uh, started ramping up big time. I've looked at all the other states that are um, in similar or worse situations, but no excuses. If Emily or others uh, you know, need that extra support, um, uh, A, maybe just send, send us those names. We can try and respond as best we can on an individual basis. But even more importantly, know that um, 
Every day, I believe, the good people over at the Department of Labor have ramped this up in a significant way, got um, almost all of the claims that were properly processed out the door right now, and uh, I think we're catching up big time. Telephones are just a mess. They're a mess in cable TV where I came from, because when there's an outage, you know, everybody calls at the same time. And that's no excuse. We've got to do better there as well, get additional people who can at least give people the answers to the questions they need. I take your message loud and clear. Next to the Associated Press. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Governor, I was hoping to follow up on Brian Hallenbach's question uh, regarding the letter from the Southeast delegation. Is there any alternative to gaming, uh, online gaming or something like that, that they're asking for to help this region? Because this, I can't think of another part of the state where such a huge employer is shut down. You've got thousands of people out of work. Uh, you've got the city of Norwich uh, that has a public utility that lost about, I don't know, over 20 something percent revenue because they're not getting the uh, they're not getting the, the casinos. Mohegan was buying water from them. You've got uh, launder laundry company that's no longer buying electricity and water. I mean, it's a huge economic hit. Is there anything that is in the works to maybe help this part of the state? Well, I really care about the people. I care about getting those people back to work safely. Um, I, I, I do worry a lot about the nature of a um, big gathering place like a casino is that does bring in people from all over the region and maybe all over the Northeast region. Seems to have a big, uh, you know, a number of elderly that are attracted to something like this. So I've got to work very carefully with the tribes to make sure what, if, what we do when is done in the most thoughtful way possible because it's a, um, it can be a place that's a source of high risk if we don't take it appropriately. And, and are there any other options? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and I, uh, I would just also add that um, the, the governor has been in constant conversation with uh, the tribal leaders. Uh, we'll continue those conversations tomorrow. Uh, myself and uh, Commissioner David Lehman will be part of those discussions as well. Uh, and we're also having discussions with our regional partners, understanding uh, what is happening in terms of ca uh, casinos uh, in our region. Um, in terms of uh, your more specific question, Sue, uh, in terms of anything else that we're doing, you basically have spoke directly at the core. Uh, the core is that uh, these uh, two entities play a large factor into that region, and that's why we're having uh, explicit and direct and constant conversations with them, but also understanding the overall public health aspect of uh, casinos uh, and the way that they play a role as uh, not only cultural, but also tourist attractions uh, in our region. But I'm just wondering, is there any kind of uh, thought about a bailout plan or something? I mean, just, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with Norwich because I live here, but there's, uh, you know, over 164 vendors in Norwich alone that, and a lot of them are out of out of business right now. Uh, and like I said, the city itself relies on revenue from the public utility, and that's not coming in as much. That's a um, first of all, we still have 100 billion in the PPP loans from the federal government. So Sue, I'm going to take that message uh, to David and see if we can target uh, those companies so where maybe we can get them some um, immediate assistance now. Okay, thank you. News 12, Connecticut. Hi, Governor. So when you talk about contract, contact tracing, um, are we talking about asking restaurants and businesses, stores to, you know, collect detailed information about customers? I mean, I know some states are thinking about that. There are some privacy concerns, but I mean, is, aren't you really going to have to do that to figure out, you know, where an outbreak started? Want to try that? Yeah, no, it, it, regardless of where the, you know, when someone tests positive and, and they uh, go into the contact tracing uh, system, regardless of where they've been, whether they've been in a business, whether they haven't, um, you know, they're, they're interviewed and they, and they uh, you know, if they opt in and they're willing to participate, which we expect based on experience, most people will, that most people want to help, most people want to protect their friends and their family and, and help uh, protect their health. Um, we'll follow those leads uh, wherever they will be. Um, but again, it is voluntary at this point, um, but we are optimistic. I think the people of Connecticut have shown that they want to play an active role in doing the right thing to help reduce the spread of COVID and participating in the contact tracing efforts are a, a very important part of that. But I mean, obviously, I mean, obviously you can, you know, the person who 
contracts COVID can tell you, you know, where I've been and so forth. But how do you figure out who all the other people uh, that were at that restaurant that day are? First of all, he tells us who he came into contact with. That's the most important thing we do in the contact trace. And when you get that call, we say, um, who have you been in contact with over the last three, four, five days? And, uh, th those, and he can or she can say, I'd like to give you that information or I wouldn't like to give you that information. Most people we think have, we're already beginning to do this. And, um, and as Josh said, that's a way to keep your friends safe. And Governor, real quick, uh, any update on the dentist and the hygienist after yesterday's meeting? I think we've got some good news there, Josh. Yeah, the, so the, the group that met uh, yesterday, they're, they're putting, bringing together the synthesis of their thoughts and recommendations. We expect that that's a document that could uh, be finalized as soon as tomorrow, um, potentially more review to come. But the, the sense was from the group that was there, which was equal parts of hygienists as well as dentists, was that there was a lot of common ground around what the right protections are for hygienists for more routine procedures in ways that don't generate aerosols that ensure that the people uh, working in dentist offices have all the necessary protective equipment. And if they don't, then they won't open. Um, that's going to be a very firm requirement to make sure that employee safety and patient safety comes first. That, that's true for all of the guidance we're putting out and all of the actions that we're taking in these baby steps for May 20th. So we're not looking at like a blanket delay? Um, for, for dentists specifically? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, assuming that the two groups can come to some common ground, which it sounds like they will, then uh, presumably not. But again, it will be case by case for a certain dentist's office. They need to ensure that they have the right protections in place, the right protective equipment. Um, and until they get to that point, then, uh, then you know, that, that's uh, not going to be a safe situation. News 8. For the governor and Dr. Coe, other states have opened up earlier, and you've been looking at those. You talked about the super spreader over in Korea, at the nightclubs. What other kinds of things are you seeing that you like or don't like that the other states are doing? For example, California already has canceled fall semester at their statewide university system. You want to start with that, Albert? Sure, sure. And, and let, me, let me just, before getting into that, um, uh, that question, let me just go back to the importance of contact tracing. So I think one thing it's important to understand is, is that not all contacts are high-risk contacts. And, and actually, we use a rule of, you know, six, you know, within six feet face-to-face -face within 15, 10 to 15 minutes. And so if you can imagine yourself going to a restaurant, you're not having high-risk contacts with everybody in the res restaurant, especially when we're having, uh, you know, uh, social distancing. So I think that's something important to understand about contact tracing and the nature of contacts and how they cause tra transmission. Getting back to uh, the original question, which was the, you know, the, that about what other states are doing. You know, I think, you know, what we've tried to do, and at least, you know, for the reopening Connecticut uh, advisory board, is really put set the highest bar on, on safety in, in public health. And as I mentioned before in previous, um, in previous uh, press conferences, is that our state is at risk. The country is at risk for resurgence. We know because of the transmissibility of this disease. So we have to put in all of the detection systems, such as the ramping up, which is, you know, the governor and Josh has said it, to 42,000, so we can detect an adverse signal, you know, in, in a, the risk of a resurgence. And we're gonna have to keep that, keep that going. And that's a critical key pillar of, of, our, of our response. And if you look at other states, that's what they have been doing as well. But we're going to be going beyond. And I think all of the, all of the, the um, interventions that the governor talked about today, about protecting the vulnerable, that's been another key cornerstone of our, the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Board's um, recommendations, as well as the state's recommendations. We have to protect the people in nursing homes. We are doing the same and, uh, as, uh, as many other states. Uh, New York, you know, has just announced that they're screening their nursing home workers to protect their nursing home residents. We are we have um, we have started doing this um, already in, in Connecticut. We have to keep our our uh, correctional facilities safe, safe both the you know the incarcerated as well as 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 well as the um, 
um, as well as the correctional staff. We have to go to where the the highest risk or the highest burden of the epidemic has hit. And those are our cities, whether Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford, Waterbury, Danbury. And those, is, those are actually behind the rationale of rolling out community-based testing and um, in supports that we're, we're talked about today. So if you look and can, you know, see across the country, we're actually ahead of the curve in terms of really the intensity and the scope of, of what we're, um, what we've, um, how to say it, uh, what we've um, uh, proposed as, as recommendations from the advisory board and which are now being implemented by the state. Connecticut Public Governor? Media. Connecticut Public oh, Media. Oh, uh, Governor. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Um, I, I didn't know if the governor saw anything in particular or how he feels about California closing the schools or what he's seen at other states that he likes or doesn't like. I, I thought it was too early to make that decision, as they did in California. Um, I, I think we have a model group that came out in terms of the metrics we have as we slowly reopen our, uh, say, colleges. Um, uh, and I think it's we're going to make a determination on that later based on the facts on the ground and how we've done I, I look around the rest of the country, though. I spend a lot of time. I mean, I see, as I said before, the uh, crowds going into the bar in um, Wisconsin, I think it was. I, I know Mike DeWine in Ohio, and he's opened up a little bit, and there were some flare-ups, but it was a flare-up in a prison in uh, Marion. So it was, tends to be those most vulnerable populations where still you see um, the greatest, greatest risk. So we, we're learning because we're a few weeks behind a lot of other uh, parts of the country in terms of how they're doing things. And we're going to uh, adjust along the way. Connecticut Public Media. Ali Wachowski here. Um, as sample sites grow, what outreach is the administration doing to educate people about the importance of testing, you know, besides these daily press briefings that not everyone might see? Amy, you want to talk about that a little bit, how we're educating people about the importance of testing? Yeah. Thank you. We are working with a lot of community partners. That's a lot of what our community committee has been talking about, making sure we can get the key messages out there, but also making sure that we have the right partners to be able to do that, to go into the communities, to share the messages about how important it is to be tested, how important it is to, to, to do that for yourself, but also for those around you. So we are, we're working with our community partners to make sure that, that those messages get out. And by community partners, do you mean like churches? Can you give us an example of what community partners are? Yeah, on our, our community um, committee, we have folks from, as I said, from AARP, from our area agencies on aging, but we also have folks that are um, in communities talking with churches, talking with um, other nonprofit organizations that are out there. We've been talking with our um, health care partners in the communities to try to make sure we can get those messages out. Our goal is really to work through the organizations that are established and trusted in those communities, right? So it's friendly faces for folks um, that know they can come out, um, and receive testing, receive other care if they need it, receive assistance. So we're not really looking to reinvent the wheel, but more get resources out into the communities where they can be most effectively deployed. And, and I'll also add, one of the most effective marketing tool for testing is actually having testing in the neighborhoods in which the individuals are actually living and where they congregate, uh, where they call home. And that was the perfect example that the governor spoke in the onset of the press conference of the work with uh, Hartford Healthcare, uh, Senator Doug McQuarrie uh, in Phillips AME Church uh, that had over 300 people there get tested. Um, that was uh, a community that knew that church, knew that senator, and uh, those are the kind of uh, examples that we're looking to replicate throughout the state. Okay, and for the, the tests, are most of them being done here, or are they being sent out um, for the results? Are we to the point where most of the of the tests are um, done in state? 
So in, in the early days of the epidemic, most of the, the tests had to be done out of state at the big commercial labs like Quest and, and LabCorp. And that was part of the reason that some of the test results were turning around too slowly, frankly, to be able to support contact tracing and some of the rapid interventions that we're designing now. So in the RFP that we've done and the contracts that we've uh, been awarding to help scale up our testing capacity, We've really focused on that turnaround time, and that's really drawn us to a lot of in-state labs like Jackson Labs, Yale, uh, Genesis Diagnostics, um, and others where we are in-state. We have control over our own destiny here in the state of Connecticut, but most importantly, we know we can get that rapid 24-hour turnaround and get those positive cases into the contact tracing system as quickly as possible. So today, the vast majority of the testing that we've scaled up is in Connecticut. First Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Um, hi, Governor. Um, not to be presumptuous to put words in your mouth, but you were just saying we're going to adjust along the way. Um, isn't that really the, what you're trying to get across to people who want to know when the phase two openings are going to start, when the restaurants are going to be allowed to move some people indoors and um, the whole phase two aspect here? Yeah, Ken, I, I've thought about this sort of in monthly increments. And if May 20th we have a um, small partial reopening, for example, of the outdoor restaurants you mentioned, you know, over the next two to three weeks we'll have a chance to analyze what the effects have been, and that will give us some guidance for what people can expect on June 20th. And as I suggested before, you take that out right through the summer and think about what September of uh, 2020 looks like and what we can think about in terms of schools and residence halls and the such. So, and maybe, um, you know, maybe everything is not a straight line. Maybe there's some fallback. Maybe there's um, some flare-ups that come in from Boston or someplace we have to adjust along the way. Um, that was part of the advice we gave our universities, by the way, uh, Rick Levin's committee. They said, assume you'll be opening in September, but assume you have to change, but make sure you have a contingency if you have to change course in uh, early August, because we may have to give you a change of notice. That's the world in which we live. Uh, th uh, thanks. Could I ask Dr. Cole a question, please? Yeah, yes, please. Go ahead. Um, could, could you give us an update, sir, on the childhood inflammatory syndrome? Um, maybe how many kids are, are uh, afflicted now, um, what you're finding out about it over the last uh, few days. We haven't had you in, um, um, in public talking about it for a while. No, thank you for that question. And, and as you can imagine, we're all, we're all um, concerned about the reports. And actually, these reports first happened in England, where they've identified several clusters of, of kids with this inflammatory syndrome. You know, this actually appears to have happened, is, uh, is happening, you know, weeks or days, if not weeks, after uh, the kids have gotten COVID. It's probably, we don't know why it's happening, but what it's causing is this, you know, systemic inflammation that's many times involving the heart, sometimes the gastrointestinal system. Uh, you know, these kids uh, have actually done well, but they've actually had, you know, this very, you know, undergone shock or, you know, hypotension low blood pressure with shock requiring, you know, um, care in the int uh, intensive care units. Now what we're learning about is, is that this is actually happening here in the United States. Everyone has heard about the number of cases in, in New York. And just like New York, we're, we're several weeks behind. So now we're starting to identify these cases among, among our kids. At this point, and I was just talking to my colleagues and friends at, at Yale New Haven Hospital, Rick, Dr. Rick Pierce, as well as uh, Dr. Juan Salazar, who's the chief medical officer at, uh, at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. You know, they're seeing cases. They have right now four cases at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital and two cases, and perhaps a third suspected cases in, in, in Hartford. So this is something that we're, wor we're worrying about. This is concerned about where we know that, you know, um, we are gonna learn a lot probably about why this happens, who it happens. I think what we know now, at least at this part, is, is that there's likely an association with the COVID virus. We have to uh, stay vigilant on it. It still appears to be a relatively rare phenomenon, given what we expect of all the kids who have been exposed to, to COVID. But that's what we know at this moment. We will probably learn a lot more in the next some coming days and weeks. 
Albert, let me just add Thank to that. Thank um, I, I get a lot of feedback from people that say, look, just put the vulnerable population away. Put them, quarantine them, and let the other 75% of us go. Okay, we'll get infected, and uh, then we'll have herd immunity, and uh, everything will be fine. And, but, Albert, what you reminded me is we know so little about COVID. We've got, um, and, and this is something we didn't even know about a, a few months ago. And this is a, a germ that could have long-term or medium-term um, impacts on people. This is what we're learning every day, which is why we have to be so cautious, I think. No, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly right, Governor. We're, we are concerned about, you know, the, uh, you know, when this whole outbreak, and just imagining this is a whole, you know, a new pathogen, first identified in, in you know, the end of December, beginning of June. It's uh, spread throughout the world. We have a pandemic. And every day was something that was coming out about this, about this virus and what it does. And I think we just have to learn from lessons in the past. We've seen countries, you know, um, you know, learn, you know, use the herd immunity or just let everything go approach and then having to come back. And that was a cautionary tale that what happened in, in uh, the United Kingdom. And that's also the cautionary tale for us here in Connecticut. You know, we see other states that have opened up their economy very quickly, not the small grade, you know, baby steps that we're taking. And, and we're concerned about our, our, our neighbors and we're talk, concerned about our fellow citizens in the United States. And so this is, this is just underscores the, the caution that we need and to put always the public safety first. Thanks. The Hartford Current. Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, as you said, you have uh, gotten some pushback on the reopening from both the left and the right. Uh, today it was the Senate Democrats with some letters, and previously it was Republicans. Um, do you have any regrets that you didn't put any legislators on the advisory group for direct input? And, and why didn't you put any legislators on the group? Uh, because... Uh with our team, they were scientific professionals and, um, and obviously business uh, folks who were actively frontline involved. But what was really important to me, Chris, was making sure, and uh, poor Dr. Coe has had to do hours of this, we briefed the legislators on a regular basis, back and forth, conversations, know exactly what we're thinking about, what we're doing, why we're doing it, augmented by what Paul Mounds has done as well. So we're doing everything we can to make sure that um, Everything the reopened committee has been doing is totally transparent, especially when it came to the legislature. Okay, also on the, uh, if, if I can ask very quickly, uh, so were you surprised today that one of the Senate Democratic letters had 25 questions? Had, uh, is it your position that they had been briefed on that? There was literally 25 questions on the letter today. Well, one of the things I'm finding is maybe you brief all the leaders, but that doesn't necessarily mean all the other members of the legislature get the information. Um, Paul, do you want to step in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to step in. Like, I, I think one of the things that was said in terms of the legislative involvement, uh, I think myself, uh, Andrew Newey and Albert Coe will say that we've done many of calls uh, with legislators on both sides of the aisle. Uh, about the reopening, uh, many of their comments and their inputs from their caucuses led to modifications uh, to many of the uh, standards that have been put out. Um, I, I can speak directly to uh, Dr. Coe, who did a, about an hour and a half call just with Senator Fasano uh, the, uh, uh, the other day based upon a request he has. I, I will say this overall, uh, the legislature always has a role to play and uh, the executive branch has a role to play as well. And uh, we've been working in collaboration uh, in, in all aspects as it deals with this reopening, uh, making sure that they're well up to date, making sure that their input is in, in is part of the process. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the decision making on this is not just from the recommendations that come from the reopening committee, it comes directly from the governor who takes in all this information and, and make these decisions. Uh, and we've been working under that aspect. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any legislators' questions. Uh, we had commissioners, uh, min uh, members of the administration, senior staff of the governor, uh, as well as reopen committee who have had hundreds of conversations with legislators and will continue to do so throughout this whole process. Uh, but one letter is not going to, uh, or a few letters are, are not going to deter the progress that uh, this whole reopening process has been making, and but we will be happy to answer them directly. 
Okay, also, Governor, one last thing. Uh, the, uh, the new CEO at the Partnership for Connecticut has been paced, uh, placed on unpaid leave, as you know. Uh, did you know about that in advance, and uh, do you think she should be replaced? Uh, I was informed about that, um, you know, just a few days ago, and uh, let me get all the facts in place. Uh, I think there's going to be a special meeting of the board, and I can report back to you. Waterbury, the Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks. Uh, start off with a couple of reader questions that uh, I think uh, should be fairly simple answer. Um, if fitting rooms are going to be closed, what about footwear? Uh, how will customers be able to try on shoes and sneakers and boots? All right. Who wants that one? <laughs> <laughs> The silence is deafening. I'll tell you what we have done, though, because I don't have an easy answer for you on this. We have met with um, a number of the folks that run the leading clothing stores to get their very best input on how we can do this on a safe basis. As Dr. Koch can tell you, the germ can stay in a shoe or in a piece of clothing for um, a few days. Um, I can't tell you exactly how they've resolved uh, trying on shoes, but I know they've come up with a solution. Um, th thank you. Thank Thanks, you guys. That. You were no help at all. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Governor. I can, I can add one thing. Um, th those are the questions that keep us up all, all night and day. Um, and, uh, and, and that's actually a, a question which, um, you know, we have, uh, as you know, I think one of the, the um, really good outcomes of the reopening Connecticut Advisory Board, but also working with the state, is that we have people from the state OSHA you know, working together with leading academics, leading experts in the occupational health, and, and really going through all those nitty gritty types of questions. And a lot of them have already been placed for a lot of the businesses on the website, the Connecticut.gov coronavirus uh, website. Um, but those questions exactly about um, how to deal with shoes, and those are the things that are keeping us up all night, and, uh, and that's work in progress. So you'll, you'll find those guidelines coming up pretty soon. Yeah. And I I guess I'll jump in and add that uh, David Lehman, uh, the member of the team of OSHA, uh, as well as Dr. Cull and his team have been working directly with the retailers on these kind of very specific questions. This is the perfect example of why this, how this reopen committee is working. Uh, so much so that we got a question from House Democratic Caucus about consignment shops uh, and, the, and individuals trying on closing consignment shops and how that process is working and provided uh, input and information that helped uh, further inform the overall process. So um, I think as you go into these very, very specific questions, that's when you get to see uh, the secret sauce that is how this uh, reopen committee has been working uh, to make sure we're putting out guidelines that is not only informing uh, the retailers, informing the public, but also making sure that they're comfortable uh, with the reopen potentially on May 20th. Okay, state law lets retailers set uh, their own refund policies, uh, exchange policies, as long as they're conspicuously posted so customers can read it. Uh, but uh, we're getting a question, if you can't try on clothes in stores, can you return them if you try them on at home? Let us get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. Well, this one I think you might be able to answer them, Governor. Um, uh, currently, uh, Bradley Airport, International Airport, is not screening for COVID-19 because apparently it's not required by CDC guidelines. Uh, why isn't the state of Connecticut requiring uh, any kind of COVID-19 uh, screening at Bradley International Airport? Uh, my understanding is, and uh, Josh, correct me, I think 95 percent of the passenger traffic at a Bradley Airport is uh, virtually ground to a halt. It's almost all, um, you know, package delivery at this point. Uh, but uh, to your bigger point, um, you're right. COVID uh, came to the um, Northeast, uh, not necessarily from Wuhan, but came through Europe and, uh, and, and right to JFK and right to a Newark International Airport. That was the COVID highway. And uh, there, the testing would have been really advantageous early on. Okay. And uh, final question. I guess this one will be for Dr. Coe, and I'm sure Josh, if he wants to, uh, Lowell Portland, as well as yourself, Governor. Uh, the letter from, well, one of the letters from the Senate Democrats 
said that uh, um, the guidelines set by your reopen advisory group indicate 42,000 tests per week are required to begin reopening, but 140 tests per week are needed to prevent new outbreaks. When will either of these targets be met? Uh, and can you assure sufficient testing materials can be sourced to maintain these testing levels? Good. Uh, th yeah, thank you. That's the, that, the, let me answer that uh, first. And, and Josh, do you want to add to that? So, so let's just think about why testing is important. And testing serves multiple purposes. Uh, you know, the, the uh, presentation by the governor today is just one. But the other that's important is that testing allows us to detect outbreaks or text, te detect uh, increases in, trans in transmission. And so 42,000 tests allows us to broadly cover all the people who, are, uh, who have symptoms and who are able to uh, you know, potentially pass the disease on to others. But it also gives us an opportunity to do surveillance, right, and to identify, rather than having to wait until somebody comes to the hospital, identify them early in the course of illness. And so we get to get a better handle about if, whether we have an increase, you know, of transmission in the, in the communities. So that's the importance of, that's the importance of testing. And that 42,000 gives us that, that uh, which, you know, the state is going to reach in the next several days, gives us that opportunity. To do all the other part, we're going to have to do more than just testing those 42, you know, thousand people who have symptoms, and we have to go beyond. And that's where we're going to try to do as we're opening up in, in these small steps the economy to prevent the transmission by screening people, whether it's not not only the people in the north nursing homes or in our correctional facilities, but also in our in our high risk communities. And that's what's our goal in the next six weeks as we go up to uh, the end of June. Add so uh, specific to where we are today against the goal of 42,000 tests a week for May 20th with those agreements that we uh, mentioned in the charts with those various labs in Connecticut we now have locked in capacity for over 70,000 tests per week uh, by May 20th um, in terms of the question about the supplies uh, the governor's been on the phone with the chief executives of the key suppliers that those labs count on for their supplies and has received personal assurances that the supplies are uh, will be uh, in place when we need them. And then we're on our track from there to keep going. And as the governor said before, we expect to be over 100,000 tests a week uh, and beyond um, into, the month of, uh, into the month of June. All right, everybody, Max has uh, given me the signal. Um, Dr. Koh, again, thank you so much. I hope you're not up all night long thinking about the trying on the shoe issue. Um, you may be here outside. There's um, a horn honking protest. Um, something that happens uh, more frequently. I have no idea whether they think we're reopening too quickly or too slowly. I like to think that means maybe we're getting uh, this balance right. And Dr. Koh just reminded me, talking about uh, the childhood effects uh, on, uh, from the COVID, uh, to misquote Donald Rumsfeld, we know what we know, but what just importantly is to know what you don't know. That's why what we're doing, we're proceeding very cautiously one step at a time. Thank you, everybody.